Hello, I'm Pastor Joel Silverman. Thank you for watching Regeneration Television Broadcast. It's my hope that through this message you are encouraged and made stronger in Jesus Christ and the truth of His Word. Enjoy this message and may God richly bless you. Uh, this is week four of the Seven Mountain Teaching. I encourage you, if you haven't heard the others, get them because they kind of flow in a sequence and I think you'll be very blessed with it. But I wanted to uh, bring us back to Isaiah 2, uh, verse 2, which says, In the last days, how many of us think we're in the last days? The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. For he will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So we talked about this as we've been talking about the seven mountains, that it's really the Lord's mountain is over every single mountain in the world. God is supreme, and we need not fear that, no matter what we see or how we see times worsening or crazy things happening or everything that we're talking about in politics that's been going on. But we have to have culture, uh, to, we have to have Christian character to impact our culture. Uh, God has different standards than the world. It is not acceptable for us to just blend in with the world and look like the world and taste like the world and smell like the world. We need to be a different different, peculiar people is what the word really says. And if you are a Christian, then our life needs to display these qualities. We're not just talking about, you know, church on Sunday. We're not just talking about us gathering as believers. That's wonderful. It's a place of training. It's a place of equipping. It's a place of coming together and worshiping the Lord. It's a place of hearing testimonies to be encouraged. But every one of us goes out from here. Every one of us has places of impact. And we talked about the seven mountains, religion, family, government, education, media, arts, and we would put entertainment or even uh, sports in there and even business. And so all of these places, we're all placed on some one or probably several of those mountains. And people in the world really do want to see people of character. You know, they may not be in that place themselves, but they want to see people who will make a difference in the world. And God wants to equip us, train us, and make us ready. When we're talking about uh, Roland and uh, with Ricky, you know, I'm thinking of all the years God has been training them for such a time as this. Everything every one of us is going through is training grounds for the next place that God wants to bring us to, where he can really release us. Now, let's look at our first PowerPoint. Just going to summarize quickly. But the first characteristics we talked about this is excellence. We looked at Daniel's life. That's a life lived in obedience to God in the midst of being taken hostage in a foreign land. Because of his close relationship with the Lord, Daniel was entrusted with the gift of interpreting the king's dreams. Let me tell you, this man, boy, he was really in the beginning, proved himself trustworthy. And we talked last week about the testings of God, how we have to prove ourselves trustworthy to God. You know, we all talk about trusting God, can I trust God, learning to trust God, how do I trust God, there's a million books written on it. But the real question is, can God trust you? Are you trustworthy to the Lord? Or do you cave in under the circumstances and the testings of life? Daniel did not, and he served the Lord, I think it was even four or five kings he served under in the course of his lifetime. Daniel 6.3 says, Then this Daniel was distinguished above the presidents and the satraps, that's the government of that day, 
because of an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. An excellent spirit. So in the character of a Christian, we have to be operating in excellence. God isn't talking perfection. He's talking excellence. That we are attempting to do the best with what God has given us and be faithful to him in that situation he places us in. Next one, the next characteristic is integrity. Proverbs 11.3, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. There is no substitute for integrity. I want us all to say this. There is no substitute for integrity. You are either walking in integrity or you are playing a game. Unfortunately, the only one you're fooling is yourself. Oswald Chambers, wonderful, wonderful. We read this the last couple of weeks. He says, we are only what we are in the dark. All the rest is reputation. What God looks at is what we are in the dark, the imaginations of our minds, the thoughts of our heart, the habits of our bodies. These are the things that mark us in God's sight. In other words, who are you when no one's looking? How do you really act? Do you really display the character of Christ? You know, when the, the press comes on, do you display the character of Christ? And you know, it's so important, looking at that scripture, the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. You can't have a little integrity. You either have integrity or you don't. It's like being a little pregnant. You know, you're, you either are or you're not, but you're not a little of one. And so when we have integrity, we need to be forthright. We need to be honest, whether it's on income tax, whether it's in speaking with one another, whether it's in the job and the things that we do and situations we find ourselves in, in job situations. I remember in the many years that I worked in the corporate world, I wound up in a situation that was probably could have cost me my job and it was uh, someone had helped me prepare a bill this was of multi-million dollars uh, to go out to somebody else and so uh, she didn't check her numbers and so long story short the bill went out and it was a big error in it and uh, it would have been very easy for me to say well so and so did it but I knew when this bounced back at me, the Lord was saying to me, be honest. And I was over that person, and the reality was the buck stopped here. Whether she made the error or didn't make the error, I was supposed to have checked that to that degree. And so I can remember waiting for my boss to come back from lunch, and you know how your stomach is in a knot, and you're like, oh boy, this is gonna tell a story. And uh, I shared with him what had taken place, and you know, he looked at me, he listened, this wasn't the easiest person in the world, and uh, he said, to me, don't worry about it. I appreciate your honesty. See, in the corporate world, how many of us work in the corporate world? You don't see a whole lot of honesty. You don't see forthrightness. You see a lot of che you know, cheating and skimping and cutting corners and lack of integrity. But when there is a lack of integrity that sticks to you like Velcro, people know they can either trust you or they can't trust you. And this person that I was working for was an extremely, extremely influential person and he did bills that were six figures minimum and so he knew by that action he could trust me and he said that to me later I appreciate your honesty and I know I can trust you things go wrong just let me know and we'll work something out he wasn't looking for perfection he was really looking for honesty and integrity let's look at our next PowerPoint <clears throat> servant leadership we looked at Joseph's life. Again, a young man who suffered the anguish of betrayal several times in his life, not just once, several times, yet remained committed and faithful to the Lord and how powerfully God used him on the government mountain. You know, it's interesting when you look at Daniel, you look at Joseph, they never came under a victim mentality. They never came under an entitlement mentality. They never came under a God, you have abandoned me mentality. I'm sure they felt pain, anguish, fear, frustration, disappointment, all the things any one of us feel. But overriding that, 
They placed their trust in the Lord. And so we talked about the serious testings that Joseph uh, went through in his life. And we have to understand that testings come to us also. You know, the culture we live in says, why should this be happening to me? Well, guess what? It's life. It's life. You know, life is full of pain. Life is to show us we need a savior. Life has problems in it. Nothing in scripture says <clears throat> you're going to have a rose garden. Nothing in scripture says you're not going to have problems in your life. As a matter of fact, Jesus said you will have trials and tribulations, but be of great joy. I have overcome the world. But the tests are when we walk through the trials and the tribulations. How do I respond? How do I react? Do I react like a crazy person? Do I react as a gossiper? Do I react with vengeance? I'm going to get somebody back. Do I react that I'm cutting you out of my life? Do I react that I'm checking out of church? See ya. Had enough. Moving on. See, those are all immature, fleshly reactions. And God will allow us to go through that mountain one more time or ten more times till we start to get the message. When we go around the mountain of testing, it's about learning. It's just like being in school. You had to learn things, and then we were tested on them, weren't we? Sometimes we did great, sometimes we did lousy. But tests come to prove. God is saying he's not looking for us pass or fail. He's saying, I want to prove your faith. I want you to see that you have the qualities of Christ within you as you walk through life. I want the world to see that you can be a person who is trustworthy. Trust in today's day and age is going to be one of the most needed qualities and characteristics in a life. When you look at the people on these mountains now that you would say, could I trust them? I don't think probably there's a hand in here that would say yes. And so God is looking to put people on those mountains, just like Roland shared, who can be trusted to be faithful to the Lord in the press of life. Let's look at PowerPoint number four. Psalm 105, 16 is clear about the testings of God. He, that means the Lord, called for a famine upon the land. The Lord broke the staff of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons, that's chains. We can just imagine him being imprisoned and, and, and in these chains. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. To reality. And I, like you, I don't like testings. I'm not waking up today and say, hey, God, lay another test on me. I'm, I'm ready. I'm willing. I'm like, Lord, have mercy. But when we go through the test, we need to understand God is in it with us. God is in it with us. One of the things I've learned to do in later years is when situations come, I will immediately say to the Lord, come into this with me. That's my prayer. That's the first thing I'll say in my tears, my heartache, where you feel like you just had a knife thrust through you. I'm saying, Lord, come into this with me. Guide me. Teach me. Tell me what to say, how to handle it, what to do. Don't let Carol react like Carol. Let Carol react like Christ. That takes a yielding to him to react like him in the midst of that trial. Look. We're as human, I'm as human as you are. Otherwise, you hear news and you get what? Reactionary. And so we have these big reactions which damage relationships and then the whole situation starts worsening and growing when the Lord is saying, I'm going to come into it, I want to contain this. You know, to maintain damage, damage maintenance, God will come in and start to bring his truth. But just Joseph, Daniel, you and I will be tested. 
20 years after Joseph was given his dream, 20 years later, it came to pass. 20 years he was being tested, probed. You gotta see the faces I'm looking at. Pinched, poked, prodded by the Holy Spirit. 20 years later, came to pass. See, God's word will come to pass. You know what happens to us? We throw in the, in the towel in the middle of the test. We thwart our own destiny. God doesn't. God sees the end from the beginning. God is saying, hang in there and hang in there with me, not just with yourself. Hang in there with the Holy Spirit. So as you go through those 20 years, you know God is being faithful. He's teaching you, training you, teaching you to exercise your muscle of faith, teaching you to declare and decree the word of the Lord in the midst of the trial. When you can't see things, you got to speak it forth. That is faith. If not, we're just operating in unbelief. We're immature and we're really baby Christians. We have to get past this fact of why is this happening to me. It happened to you. Let God into it. Let God train you. And let God give you words and a vision for the end of the test that will say, I'm going to bring this about. Joseph had a vision when he was a boy of his parents and his brothers and leaders bowing down to him. In his immaturity, he shared that with his family. We know the end result that came from that. But the reality was God was giving him a snapshot See, God can give you a snapshot many, many, many years before you will ever come to see that to pass. He gives you a picture. He lays something in your spirit. He begins to say, this is where I'm taking you. You've got to hang in there with me as you walk through your life. See, God will be faithful to us even when we're not faithful to him. And he's... he's putting that snapshot. The snapshot is the vision of your destiny. Look at our board for a minute. We, to arrive at our destiny, we've been talking over the last few weeks about gifts of the Holy Spirit and bless the Lord for the gifts of God. But the ingredient that has to be developed in you and I, character. Godly character. Christ-like character, character of humility. That has to be forged, and it's forged in the fire of affliction. It's forged, literally, in that. Let's look at our next PowerPoint, Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes all things, everybody say, all things to work together for good for those who love God. Do you love God? Yes. Are you here? Are you called according to his purposes? So that means you've got to give up your purposes. Oh, oh yeah, a little catch. <laughs> a little catch. Oh, I have my pur Yeah, I have my purposes and God has his own purposes for me. And guess what comes into a collision? My purposes and his purposes. See, God has that snapshot, that vision of your life, but you have a snapshot of your own life. How many of us would say, my life right now is just like my snapshot was 20 years ago? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. Because the life has come in. Situations have come in. Often God's way up is first to go down. Someone has wisely said the difficulties in your life are either God sent or God used. How you respond to them makes all the difference in the world. How many people right now, just by raise of hands, are in a real fix and you're knowing I've got to come through with a godly response, and I'm really struggling. See, I pray right now the Lord just pours yeah, out yeah. a yieldedness, a willingness. Lord, your will, not my will. Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he wrestled with the human will. He wrestled with our will and his own human will, because the will of man, the will of women, is so strong on the earth. I don't think there's anything stronger on the earth except the Lord himself. And we have to yield that will so that we will come to see that what we're walking in right now, God is using. 
God's using this to train you, show you, teach you, mold you, shape you, form you into the image of Christ. That has to take place in our lifetime. We're not taking the me in any one of us into heaven. Amen. That me, that self, that ego, that my purpose, my will, my plan, that's got to die. It's got to die. And so these tests that we go through actually help us to do that. It doesn't feel so great at the time, but that's what it's intended. All the pains of life are used by God to test our maturity level. Has it made you bitter or better? Do you have a testimony to bring to your mountain? Can you talk to people about the mountain you're on and the faithfulness of God? Do you have a testimony that's going on in the midst of the pain? Or have you lost your reputation because of a lack of integrity? Has your character been proven to be Christ-like or at least in the process? Have you learned you can really trust God in really difficult circumstances. This is what Daniel had to go through, Joseph had to go through, and you and I have to go through as well. Next PowerPoint, 1 Peter 1, 7 says this, so that the genuineness of your faith, everyone say genuineness of your faith, may be tested. Your faith, which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold, which is tested and purified by fire. This proving of your faith is intended to redound or come back to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is revealed. The testings are to prove, am I genuinely a Christian? Think about it. Listen, let's get real here. Everybody who goes through tests does not remain faithful to the Lord. I can tell you that as a counselor of over 20 years. People check out on God very easily because they take offense with him. They want him to give them an easy ride. They don't, I've suffered in my life and I don't want to suffer anymore. Well, get used to it. Jesus suffered. Jesus learned obedience through what? Suffering. Oh, suffering. Not through worshiping through suffering, not through having fellowship, through suffering. That's how he learned to obey the Lord. And obedience goes hand in hand with integrity. We can't say I love the Lord and obey the Lord and not be people of integrity. Remember, you get one shot, I believe one shot, at really keeping your reputation or losing it. You can lose your reputation and make a comeback, but that will take years and years and years. Integrity, knowing that we're being tested, remaining faithful to the Lord in the midst of all things. You and I are not exceptions to testing, but when we are on the path of being proven, then God can entrust us with the last characteristic, what we're gonna go over, miracles. Think about this, miracles. Miracles can come in all different forms, and miracles come on every single mountain. They may look different, they may sound different, but they are miracles of God. Think of the spemf areas that we talk all about at this church. There's spiritual miracles, there are physical miracles, there are emotional and mental miracles, there are financial miracles, there are relational uh, miracles. So we need to understand so many times we get locked into the physical miracles which are exciting and thrilling and awesome. But they are not the only miracle. Your salvation is the greatest miracle you and I will probably ever experience. Because people can be raised from the dead. People can have arms grow out and never come to Christ. Remember in the days of the children of Israel, the greatest miracles that the earth has ever seen came forth in those days where God poured out on that group of people the greatest miracles ever. Where did they wind up? In the desert. 
two went on into really the promised land. Well, I don't even know what kind of odds. Roland, you'd have to tell me what kind of odds those are. But those are stacked against you odds. So the reality is God is saying, I want to produce all types of miracles. And I want you to be a person of excellence, of integrity, be a servant leader, so that miracles can be produced. John 14, 12, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me, will do the works that I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. What a promise that is. What a promise. What are the works that Jesus is talking about? Next PowerPoint, Matthew 10, 7. Jesus says, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely, without pay, you've received. Freely, without charge, you give. Next PowerPoint, Matthew 28. Jesus approached and breaking the silence said to them, all authority. How much authority? All authority. All power and rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's speaking to his followers. Go then and make disciples of all the, na of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion to the very close and consummation of the age. Let's look at our next PowerPoint. God's word then is clear to us that even as he's doing a work in us, he wants to work through us. He doesn't wait for perfection. Look, we may be going up these mountains. We may be struggling, slipping, falling. God will still use you because when you have Christ in you, you have everything that the world needs. We don't need to get caught up in reputation. Am I saying exactly the right thing? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? Trust the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you, and he will. He wants to do a work through you. Your life has great significance to the Lord. Great significance to the Lord. It's way beyond being married and having kids and paying bills. Your life counts for Christ. And when you plug into the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, He is going to fill you with the strength, power, guidance, whatever you need for that day. He has the goods, He has the power, and He has your best intentions in His heart. He wants to use you. Look at all of us sitting in this room. Twelve people multiplied to 120 in that upper room. And when that upper room went out into that marketplace. The first time Peter spoke, 3,000 came unto the Lord. Those 120 and whatever numbers added on to them went throughout the world and turned the world upside down. It isn't about numbers. It's about hearts sold out to Christ. That's what it's about. When you are sold out to Christ, you are dynamite in the hand of the Holy Spirit spirit and you are an enemy to the enemy of your soul and God wants you to know the power that lives within you and not come under the circumstances around you but to declare to those circumstances you are going down and I'm going forward in the ways of the most high God you must declare over your own life the word the promises of God in the midst of your battle and struggle get promises from the word of God and say this is your word this is what you promised if it takes me the next 20 years it's still going to come to pass let me tell you a story most of you know this but the Lord's laying it on my heart in the years when my son Michael was in the throes of drugs like you could not believe using, selling, buying, doing whatever the Lord would say to me get your Bible and in the morning when I got up and I would have prayer time with the Lord, he gave me scriptures to begin to speak forth over this son's life. 
and I began to read scriptures over his life. And I began to speak to his dead, dry bones that in the name of Jesus, he was going to arise to his feet. He was going to serve the King of Kings. He was going to sell out to Christ the way he was sold out at that point to the devil. And that Christ was going to use him miraculously throughout his life. You saw him here last week. Let me tell you, that was a long journey that was over probably 13, 14 years. Only God knows the timing of it. And he'd come and we would look at him. Pastor Lisa would look at him, minister to him. Karen would minister to him. And you, you were like, in the natural, you said, this is hopeless. But God said, don't ever use that word regarding him. Because there's nothing hopeless with the Lord. And what happens is when we see things, we come under it in the natural. And God is saying you have to use supernatural power of the spirit over your circumstance. That's the proving of faith. I had to be proven in my faith. Lord is saying, can I trust you, Carol, in this? Carol, you want to preach to others? You want to minister the word of God? Well, you got to learn how to be able to stand for your own household when it's totally falling apart and going straight to hell. You have to learn to stand for your household. There are many people here, the Lord has so laid this on my heart that we need to be praying for the spouses of those that are not here that they are coming in. We need to be praying for the children that are not here that they are coming in. Grandchildren, we as a church need to get on fire and start declaring and decreeing the word of Christ into the circumstances. This is what Daniel learned to do. This is what Joseph learned to do. It is the testings of God on every believer leave his heart. Will you stand and declare the word of Christ to the enemy of your soul? You are going down. God may take me home in the meantime, but what I am declaring is going to come to pass. And I didn't know whether that son would ever cave in, give in to the Lord. But let me tell you something. When he caved in to the Lord, when he surrendered to the Lord, he was surrendered to the Lord. To the point, the first phone call that we got, someone had given me many years prior to this, a book which most of us know, that beautiful picture of Jesus holding, uh, a, I'm calling a drug addict in his hand, he has a hammer, he has the nail. It is a gorgeous illustration of the forgiveness of Christ, how he's embracing this young man. And someone had given me a beautiful book on this, and I had it on my coffee table, and when Michael called up for us to go for our first visit, he said, when you come, bring me that book. Wow. And I wanted to say, hello, who is this I'm talking to? We went with that book, and he took that book, and he embraced that book. He ate that book. And when I picked him up from that uh, rehab to go to a halfway house, he wasn't even coming home. We said, you're not coming home. You still have to maintain going to rehab. When I picked him up and we went to a diner, he took out a Bible from his knapsack. He sat with me in the diner and he said, I want to read to you what God has put on my heart. And I sat across from him in that diner, and I'm being very honest with you, I could hardly believe my eyes. And at that time, our church was starting to do encounters, and he went on the first men's encounter that we had as a church. And my husband said to me, when they did the whole situation on the cross, he said, Carol, he is six foot four, he went up, knelt at that cross, put his arms around that cross, embraced it, and laid on his belly and wept like a baby for an hour. I'm talking conversion. God wants to bring conversion to our households, but we are the instruments 
that speak that forth. We are the ones that God is saying, look, you've got to deposit in you. you got to prime the well. We cannot give up on our children, on, on the world. God has placed us on these mountains because he wants to use us significantly. I cannot tell you as I'm learning even myself in this teaching, the Lord keeps saying, tell my people how important, how significant their life is to me. You, the enemy uses discouragement and he wants you to give up. And we're going to look at that in a minute. And that is a great, great obstacle that is not of God and we have to take authority over. So where are we? PowerPoint number 10. God's word's very clear that he is doing a work within us. He wants to work through us. Our life has great significance to the Lord. He has invested in you of himself. You have the spirit of Christ living in you. Oh dear Jesus, I pray we get enlightened on this, the spirit of Christ living in us. He wants to use our life to impact others, even from ones and twos. Some people will impact one person, two people. Other people are going to impact multitudes of people. And that's what's called our destiny. What's one of the greatest obstacles? Discouragement. Listen to this story Os Hillman tells of a time that he was discouraged. Next PowerPoint. He says, a godly man came to me and said, you have to keep moving. There are too many who are depending on you in the kingdom. I didn't totally understand what he meant at the time. Now I know he was saying that God is preparing each of us to be the vessel he wants to use in the life of another person. But we will never be that vessel if we give up and hide in our cave of discouragement. What would have ever have happened to my son if I gave up in those years and said, I'm, I'm just giving up on this, it's impossible. Only God knows the outcome. Let's look at the next one. Exodus 4.17, the Lord says to Moses, take the staff in your hand so you can perform miraculous or the miracle signs with it. What is the staff God has put in your own hand? Are you a builder? Are you a teacher? Are you What are you? God has put something, an ability, a capability in your hand. It may be counseling. It may be speaking encouragement to other people. There are all types and forms of gifts. Moses' staff represented what he was at that point. He was a shepherd. Remember, he had left, he fled Egypt. He's out in the desert for 40 years. 40 years God tested him because he needed a 40-year test to become the man of God God was going to use to lead multitude, millions of people into that promised land. PowerPoint number 13. When we yield our talents and abilities to the Lord, God can perform miracles through them. And this is Os Hillman. He says, first, Moses had to yield what he had in his hand to God. Only after this took place could God use the staff. As long as Moses held on to it, God could not and would not perform miracles through it. Could do a whole seminar on that. As long as you hold on to your own gift and you don't give it to the Lord, can't use you for miracles. Until we come to this place with our Heavenly Father, we will fail to see miracles performed in our work. He delights in showing his power through us. When we become an open vessel, we can expect to see things happen. And he says, have you ever given your staff to the Lord? Offer it to him and see what he might do through it. You will never be the same again. Let me tell you, when we let God start to use us, no matter what mountain we're on, no matter what nine to five job we work, your job becomes exciting. Your job becomes an adventure of let me see God work in this situation. PowerPoint number 14, Matthew 17, 20. Jesus said, because of the littlest, littleness of your faith, here's what holds us back. That is your lack of firmly relying trust. For truly I say to you, 
If you have faith that's living like the grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to yonder place and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. Nothing will be impossible to you. What are you faced with today that your head is telling you this is impossible? It's not impossible. It's a proving ground that God is testing you in. All right, I'm going to say this story and then we're going to wind down. I thought this was just a great story. It's about using our faith. This is a story that Os Hillman tells. He's talking of a Swedish founder of the International Christian Chamber of Commerce, tells a story about God performing a miracle in his own business a few years ago. He owned a plastics company in Sweden. They make huge plastic bags that are used to cover bales of hay in the farmlands all across Europe. It was the harvest season. They were getting ready to ship thousands of pallets of these bags to their customers. More than 1,000 pallets were ready to ship when an alarming discovery was made. Every bag on the warehouse floor had sealed shut from top to bottom. Scientists declared the entire stock as worthless trash. Nothing could be done. The business would go out, the company would go out of business and go bankrupt. This man, his wife, and children sought the Lord in prayer about this catastrophe. The Holy Spirit spoke through various family members. The wife said, if God can turn water into wine, what are plastics? The daughter said, I don't believe this is from the Lord. We need to stand against it. The man sensed they were to trust God for a miracle in this situation, and they began to pray. They took authority over this mountain of a problem based on Matthew 17, which gave them the authority to cast a mountain into the sea if faith only the size of a mustard seed could be exercised. The following Monday, they went to the warehouse and laid hands, I love this, laid hands on every pallet, one thousand pallets, asking the Lord to restore the bags to their original condition. It literally took them many, many hours. Later, the next day, the employees began to inspect the bags. As they inspected the bags, they discovered that every single bag had been restored to its original condition. An incredible miracle had taken place. Think about that. So he says, what obstacles have been placed in your life that need a miracle today? Could God be setting the stage in your life for you to trust him at new levels? You've never trusted him before? God sets the stage to allow his power to be revealed for those willing, willing, willing to exercise the faith of a mustard seed. All things then are possible with God. Let's look at our last one. This is a wonderful quote. We are designed for God's purposes and to bring glory to him. God desires to use ordinary men and women to do the extraordinary, to do great exploits in his name. To this end, our choices both day to day and at key moments in life are used by God to prepare and transform each one of us for his purpose. Understanding why the creator made you gives you focus, provides direction, enables destiny, draws you to a life you can love to live and transform your choices. so important to see God in the situation you're in. I'm going to read this just as we wind down. I thought, again, this was very interesting because we're talking about the mountains, whether it's business, whether it's media. You have to be asking the Lord, what is it? How is it that you want to use me? And God is going to show you. Now listen to this. Some people would say that God is against prosperity. But these 10 famous Christian businessmen would disagree. 
In fact, they would likely attribute their prosperity to their faith in God and their Christian values and work ethic, integrity. And this is just a few of them. This is just a couple, but listen to this. David Green, the American entrepreneur, is the founder of Hobby Lobby, a national chain of arts and crafts stores. Forbes magazine included him in the Forbes Top 400, a list of America's wealthiest citizens. In 2009, Green built his business on biblical principles and attributes, and his success, he says, is totally because of his faith in God. Henry Hines, the founder of H.J. Hines Company, an American food company, was a 19th century Christian businessman. The Hines Company, famous for its ketchup and 57 varieties, was built on the founder's business acumen and Christian principles. Let's get this one. Conrad Hilton, the American hotelier and founder of the Hilton Hotels, cha Hilton Hotels chain, is another famous Christian businessman. Hilton based his business and philanthropic philosophy on his most enduring influences, his parents and the church. According to literature from the Hilton Foundation, his mother often reminded him, prayer is your best investment. S. Truett Cathy, founder and chairman of Chick-fil-A, national fast service restaurant chain, attributes his accomplishments to operating his business on biblical principles. His sense of obligation to the community and its youth also drives his approach. He enjoys helping young people through many scholarships and youth programs. James L. Kraft, Canadian-born entrepreneur and inventor, was the first per person to patent processed cheese. He and his four brothers established Kraft Foods, the largest American food and beverage corporation, and the second largest in the world. Kraft supported the Baptist Church and encouraged religious education for young people. Robert L. Ternu. Ternu was, Le Ternu was an American businessman, inventor, and academic. His inventions included engineering vehicles and earth-moving equipment. He had nearly 300 patents. He and his wife founded a Christian university in Texas. He was well known as a generous philanthropist to Christian causes. His colleagues called him God's businessman. Cyrus McCormick, <clears throat> this American inventor, founded the McCormick Harvest Machine Company, which became part of the International Harvester Company in the early 1900s. He invented the Reaper. McCormick died at 75 after living as an invalid for four years. According to one biographical sketch, his last words were, it's only right, all I want is heaven. J.C. Penney, the American businessman and entrepreneur, founded J.C. Penney Stores. His large income allowed for his involvement in many philanthropic causes. Causes. The 1929 stock market crash halted his work, and the Great Depression left him in financial ruin. His financial setbacks affected his health, and he even checked into a sanitarium. After hearing the hymn, God will take care of you, Penny became a Christian. He eventually recovered financially and continued his involvement in charitable works. Sam Walton, this American businessman and entrepreneur, is best known for founding Walmart. With his strong Christian background based on ethics and hard work, Walton excelled in school, college, and business. Early in his career, he served as a management trainee for J.C. Penney. He owned a chain of Ben Franklin five and dime stores before opening the Walmart in Arkansas in an effort to market American-made products at affordable prices. And then it goes on, there's many, many others businessmen that God has used, entrepreneurial giftings that God has used. And I'm going to end with this. We have to have some women in there. It was women who formed the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. Harriet Tubman, a Christian who escaped slavery herself, went on to lead an influential movement within the Underground Railroad, rescuing thousands of people. Methodist Francis Willard led two million members worldwide in the temperance movement more than a century ago, influencing many to support women's suffrage as a weapon of protection to her home 
home and tempted loved ones away from the tyranny of drink. This movement also started kindergartens, passed child labor laws, and in the 1870s created the first daycares for children of working women. We think we have anything new? Forget it. Today, evangelicalism continues to feel the effect of this one woman's leadership. In the 40s and 50s, Henrietta Mears, a dynamic Christian educator, shaped the church's future in powerful ways, discipling a number of future evangelical leaders, including Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade. Women writers have played a particularly important role in evangelism. Rosalind Rinker's prayer, Conversing with God, changed the way evangelicals prayed together. Before Rinker, many believed that prayer should be in the King's English, spoken formally as if addressing a monarch. The idea that Christians could talk to God as a friend conversationally was Rinker's idea that she placed in a book and is now so commonplace to us in Christianity. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you would like to hear more, we encourage you to visit our website. Also, if you're ever in the area, stop by. We would love to have you at Regeneration Church at Sunday service. Again, thank you for watching, and may God richly bless you.